Good morning. Good morning, Daddy. Good morning. See you all here today. Beautiful day. The Gittinses aren't with us. They're away on uh, holidays, enjoying the beauties of New Zealand. And good on them. From what I can see from the photos they've posted up, they're having a great time. Welcome to all the visitors that are here today, particularly the newly engaged couple. Good to see us. Um, wedding bells on the horizon. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Stop blushing. <laughs> Bunnies are on the left. Uh, ladies and gents. Gents and ladies. It says ladies. Either way, you can figure <laughs> it out. Um, and of course, there will be a couple at the end of the service. If you're joining us online, thank you for being here with us today. You're welcome. It'd be better to have you here in person, but digitally will do. I was lost for words there. All this modern technology is all too much. Well, we're here together to worship God, a God that is not selfish, a God that is merciful, a God that is not cruel, a God that is fair, loving and full of grace. So let's pray to God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time together. Thank you that we can come in your name to worship you and praise your Son who died for us on the cross. Father, you are a great God and we thank you that you love us. <coughs> Father, we just pause to confess that we have sinned against you and we thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness. Father, hear us now as we come together in the words your son taught us. <coughs> Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and glory are yours now and forever. Amen. This will come as a shock to you, but we're going to sing. You may sit there. <laughs> But there are more songs to come. Okay. Church family news. Do we have any news? There's no rock youth today. I know that much. But uh -huh. Uh, just a quick update on the two remaining women's ministry events for the year. Um, next one's going to be October the 21st. Uh, we did our high tea a couple of weeks ago. Um, that was more of a sweet event. We'll be aiming more savoury next time. Um, we're going to meet at Tollers, hopefully in nice weather and we can enjoy the beautiful views. Um, and we're calling it Tapas on the Terrace. So start thinking about maybe some sa a small savoury dish you can bring to share. Um, as it gets closer, we'll give you some more details, but that's the 21st of October in the afternoon. And our final event for the year will be uh, Saturday, December the 2nd. Get her Christmas theme. Um, that's just pop it in your calendar um, and we'll share some more later on. Thanks. Tap us on the terrace will still be sweet because I'll be downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> you picked the ling one. No one else? Excellent. Mari, where are you, my dear? Come forth. Mari's going to lead us in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Bible reading today is from Mark, chapter 5, verses 1. 20, if you want to follow on your Bibles. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, 
verses 1 to 20. They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the Gerasenes. As soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. He lived in the tombs, and no one was able to restrain him any more, not even with a chain, because he often had been, found, had been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him, and he cried out with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. What is your name? he asked him. My name is Legion, he answered him, because we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. A large herd of pigs was there, feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him, send us to the pigs so that we may enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. The men who tended them ran off and reported it in the town and the countryside, and people went to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the man who had been de demon-possessed sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs. Then they began to beg him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. Jesus did not let him but told him, Go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So he went out and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And they were all amazed. As I mentioned before, Samuel's away today. So we're going to watch a video of him giving us a lesson from this passage. Enjoy. Good morning. Let's pray before we look at God's Word. God, you are good. Your Word is good. Uh, Lord, you've kept it for us, for our love and our life, uh, the life of service to you. So give us hearts that are teachable, minds that are focused, so we can hear what you would have us hear today. Amen. Do we know Jesus? Do we remember who he is? Last week, we heard the disciples exclaim, Who is this man? Even the wind and the sea obey him. I mean, they're completely confused about who it is they're sharing a boat with. The disciples, they've witnessed Jesus' divine authority over all creation. And the poor guys, they, uh, they're fair enough, really. They simply have no means to comprehend what they've seen. Jesus, he calls out over, so you be quiet, and it does, right? Now, now, it's too much for them, but they're on a boat, and even though it's referred to a sea, this large lake of Galilee, it only goes so far. And finally they come to shore. And I imagine, I imagine that the questions, the wonder, the fear, still buzzing in the minds of these tired disciples. Man, so much for a restful trip. Maybe, maybe now they can take a break, take stock of what they've seen. You know, just debrief a little bit. Well, let's see. Uh, from verse, the first verse of chapter 5 of the Gospel of Mark, this is what we read. They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of Geranases. And as soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. Now he lived in the tombs, and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain. Because he often had, he'd, he'd been bound with shackles and chains, but he'd torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. You have to wonder, what darkness has led this man to this point? He, he must have just reached absolute rock bottom. Think about where he lives compared to where we live, for instance. I mean, we, you know, I'm guessing we probably have a roof over our head, a front door which we can lock, 
Uh, perhaps we even have a flushing toilet. You know, winds, windows that we can close off the heat of the day and open up to bring in the cool of the night. I mean, we have, most of us have somewhere to live, right? But this guy, it's not like he's camping in a tent. I don't know. He, he lives among the dead. He shares his bed with rotting bones. His home, his home is a bunch of caves which, which usually don't even allow an adult to stand up straight in. They're, they're so low, these caves, usually. I mean, ah, oh, think of the smell. Who in their right mind would live among the dead? This guy, this guy is as close to living death. Think about that. He is living death. Probably as much as you can get. Think about his isolation. In Jesus' day, to touch an undead person, even to touch the grave of the or the buyer of a dead person, that was to become socially and religiously unclean. And to be to be unclean means social exclusion. You couldn't be near anyone until you'd washed it and become pure after the allotted time. There were rules about this. You weren't just allowed in society, you had to be pure. But this guy, he lived among the impure. So he is, he is utterly, desperately alone. And it's no large statement to say this guy, he needs help. He desperately needs help. But even amongst all his desperation, no one has the strength to come to his aid. No one's able to restrain him or, or subdue him. He can't even be saved from himself by others. Think about it. Anyone someone tried, anyone someone got ropes or chains to bind him up so he couldn't even hurt himself, a demonic strength with their utter disregard for his well-being means that uh, ropes, even chains are not enough. No one can subdue this guy, even for his own good. He was a terror to be avoided. A terror... He has to live with. This guy must be in a, a mental, emotional, uh, physical anguish. He is a terror to be avoided. His torment was his to endure. He, he has no escape even from his own horror. Now, think about that storm the disciples were in. It, it was too big for them. But this wretched man, he lives a terrifying tempest within himself. He is trapped. He has no escape. It's, it's too much for him. But one day, as he's living this misery, he looks up and he sees Jesus in the distance. Check it out from verse 6. When this man, he, he sees Jesus from a distance, he runs and kneels down before him. Verse 7, and he cried out with a loud voice, What do you have with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. So this this bloke, he sees Jesus and he runs towards him. He falls on his knees in front of Jesus. And this terrifying, overwhelming, demonic power within this man is what? What's it doing? This terrifying, overwhelming, demonic power is begging Jesus. He's not kneeling in worship, but in horror. This horror inside of him is in terror before a much more powerful force. Listen again. What will you have with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, do not torment me. Jesus, meek and mild. No, no wait. That's, that's not Jesus. This is Jesus, one who commands a raging storm to be quiet. It's, it's this Jesus who terrifies that demon who has so terrorized this poor wretched man. Now notice, the unclean spirit, it, it names Jesus. The last time something like this happened, Jesus was declared the Holy One of God. In fact, it was a demon the last time too. Um, do you remember the demon-possessed man in the synagogue? He'd been there comfortable all, all, for who knows how long, and Jesus rocks up and starts teaching. 
and, and this demon possessed man, he, he calls out, Jesus, you are the Holy One of God. But this time, he's further described. You are Jesus, the Most High God. Not the Holy One of God. You are the Most High God, Son of the Most High God. This unclean spirit, he recognizes Jesus' power over it. The embodiment of evil is in terror of Jesus. I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. You are the Son of the Most High God. This evil power names Jesus. Now, now, do you remember earlier in the, in the boat? Uh, remember how the boat, when it suddenly became still and the storm settles around and Jesus, they looked at Jesus and they're like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Well, listen up, gents. It, and this is the confession of one who hates Jesus and his power. You want to know who Jesus is? Well, you've just been told he is Jesus, son of the most high God. And it's this Jesus who tells the demon in verse 9, what is your name? He asked him the question, what is your name? You've named me. What's your name? Verse 9, my name is Legion, he answered him, because we are many. And this demon continues to beg Jesus earnestly not to send them out of the region, pleading with Jesus. Now, a bit of point here, Jesus isn't confronting just one demon, right? That, that would be scary enough. Jesus is confronting an army of them. An army of demons who have overwhelmed a village in its oppression of this particular man. This army of demons who now concedes defeat by a superior power. And their only hope is to negotiate terms of surrender. Check out verse 11. Uh, a large herd of pigs was there uh, feeding on the hillside. And the demons begged him, verse 12, send us into the pigs so that we may enter them. Hey, you're a Jew. You hate pigs, right? Maybe, maybe this, is, this is the way that we can get away with, with surviving this interaction. So he gives them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. But the herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. Get this, though. In the presence of Jesus, first of all, the evil spirits could only do what Jesus gave them permission to do. They can only do what Jesus allows them to do. That's how powerless they are before the supreme power of Jesus. Anyway, Jesus gives them permission. And so these unclean spirits, they leave the man and enter the pigs. And what this man was forced to endure for who knows how long, what he is enforced to endure, these pigs would endure. They could endure. They could endure it for not even one more minute. 2,000 pigs, they die. Now, for us, we might raise the question, well, what about the pigs? You know, What about the loss of income for the farmers? It's really easy for us to shift straight to the loss of wealth and harm of the animals. But in doing so, we miss a much more important understanding. The life of a man or a woman is worth so much more than even a herd, even a 2,000 head herd of pigs. Furthermore, we're left in no doubt as to the reality or the scale of the deliverance. This is not like, oh yeah, I feel so much better now. No, 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 no. You can't mistake this happy herd of 2,000 pigs suddenly devastated. That's the devastation, the destruction this man was carrying around in his own personal life. This is a demonstration of just how much this man has been saved. Now, the disciples, they're probably still reeling from what they saw and experienced of Jesus' power on the Sea of Galilee. Right. Can you imagine? They're already probably a nervous wreck at this point. And now they're watching the immense force of Jesus' will as he frees this man of true oppression, total oppression. But this, this isn't enough. This isn't the real proof of Jesus' success. I mean, it's powerful enough as it is, watching these pigs. Just, right? No, no, no. Verse 14. 
The men who tended these pigs, right, they run off and report it in the town and the countryside. And the people went to see what had happened, right, as you'd expect. They came to Jesus and saw, what did they see? They saw the man who had been demon-possessed, who they had bound with ropes, bound with chains, shackles, and they'd just over, overcome everyone. Every, this guy, right, he's sitting there, properly dressed, in his right mind. And they are afraid. There he is, sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. The one who had terrorized the whole community with fear. Remember, they couldn't contain the guy, even with chains and ropes. So again, remember the disciples? They're terrified because they were stuck in a boat with a man more powerful than the full force of nature. Now it's these locals. And they're seeing something which is simply not possible. That's the guy. But as impossible as it is, they're looking at him, clothed, sitting calmly, in his right mind. So what do they do? I think about it. Surely here is a man, Jesus, who can free anyone of the greatest oppression. So what do they do? Do they ask Jesus to help them too? Do they plead with Jesus to stay and help their sick, their broken, their other desperate needs? Do they recognize his authority and ask to follow him. Oh, can we become your disciples? Can we find our life in you? Is that what they do? Let's have a look. Verse 16. Those who had seen it described it to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man. They told them about the pigs and they began to beg him to leave. To leave their region, Jesus, we beg you, go away. The demons possessing that poor man, they were too powerful for the locals. But now they face someone with even more power and authority. And they fear him. They hate, they hate him for it. They want Jesus far, far away from their lives. Perhaps... Perhaps the cost of having Jesus in their life is, is too much. Perhaps they would rather have their pigs than belong to God's saving king. When they see Jesus, they beg him to go. However, the man who was demon-possessed, what about him? What does he have to lose? How much has he received? He also begs Jesus to do something. Verse 18. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. Jesus, let me go with you. Oh, I need to be with you. You're the guy. You're the authority in this world. I need to be with you. He wants to be one of Jesus' disciples to remain with him. But Jesus Jesus has a job for this guy. No, no, no. Verse 19, Jesus did not let him, but told him, no, mate, go home. Go home to your own people. Report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has had mercy on you. Think about it. You've seen me. You understand what you've seen. You've come to accept it. Yeah, go and tell everybody else. So he did. This formerly oppressed, terrorized, demon-possessed man, he goes out, verse 20, and he begins to proclaim in the Decapolis, these, these ten Greek cities, how much Jesus has done for him. And they were all amazed. Imagine the pre-gospel message going out. This word of a Messiah, a man who has absolute authority. What a wonderful witness. Having met Jesus, having been transformed in, in that meeting with Jesus, the son of the most high God, this man is to report what? How much the Lord had done for him and about the Lord's mercy. I wonder how much we have forgotten who Jesus is. 
I wonder if our view of Jesus has begun to get a little bit too small. Or if it was ever big enough to begin with. The disciples, they're oscillating between amazement and terror before their teacher. The poor guys, <laughs> they're one moment just delighted by him and horrified by just how powerful he is. Unclean spirits, they're not like the disciples. They're terrified of a holy judge who holds absolute power over them. Now the locals, the locals, they see a rule, an authority too big, too powerful, too costly to have around. And so they ask him, no, no, no. they beg him to go away. The healed man, however, he is overcome with gratitude and begs to join the close group of disciples. He wants to go with Jesus. You are my life. You are everything. You are, you are my hope. But he's given a commission. It might sound a bit familiar, actually. He's given a commission to walk his home, to go back to his cities, to proclaim the works and mercy of God in his life. And so the question is, as we read Mark chapter 5, these first, first 20 verses, the question is, have we met Jesus? And if so, do we remember who he is? Do we understand who it is we are following? He is Lord of creation. There is no storm too big for him. He is conqueror over evil. He is more powerful than any army of darkness. He is stronger than the corruption found in the hearts of men and women. He is Lord of nations. He is Jesus, Son of the Most High God. And all will either bend the knee in terrified submission or in joyful worship. Do we remember who Jesus is? Do we know who he is? For the redeemed man, it meant declaring the work and grace of God. What does it mean for us, for you and me, to truly know who Jesus is? Let's pray. Father, as we watch Jesus, help us to be amazed again, to feel the weight, the majesty of his power, that he could command an army of demons. They could only do what he gave them permission to do. They had to beg him for mercy. And some hated him for it. Some were terrorized by him. And yet those who are saved delight in him and are given a commission. Father, Help us not to forget who Jesus is. Help us not to hate him. Help us not to reject him. Help us to see who he is and take up his commission to talk about just how much you have done through him in our life. The grace he has given us. Help us not to be ashamed of the king who has saved us from horror. Indeed, has saved us from the judgment we deserve before you. Father, help us to see afresh who it is we call our Lord and Saviour. And may it shape who we are and what we do. Amen. There is one more song. Come Before that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this passage we have just been listening to and what it teaches us about your Son, Jesus, our Saviour. We came to earth as a man lived among us and suffered for us that we might be saved. Father, we're just amazed by his love, his power over all. And we thank you for him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, kids, that brings us to an end of the service. If you are joining us online, don't forget we meet every Sunday at 9.30. Hey, who was here at 8.30 today? No one. Go on. I bet some of you tried to log on at 8.30. Um, don't forget, we meet every Sunday at 9.30 here at the Warhope Country Club. We'd love to have you join us. Until then, see you next week, whether alive or through that link.